Pass the mic. It sounds good for me. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I'm going to read some poems from my most recent book, The Do-Over, and then um, and then a few new poems. So The Do-Over is a book that is all about the grand poetic subject, death. And it, um, it, ha it kind of has a narrative spine, which is about the death of someone I loved who died. She was my stepmother-in-law, so that doesn't sound like a real close relationship, but she was also a beloved friend. And her name was Andrea. We called her Andy, um, and in the book she's called A. So I'm going to sort of bookend the reading from the do-over with two A poems, um, and then read some in between, too. The A poems and some of the other poems in this book are acrostics. So they, you know, when you look at them on the page, if you look down the left-hand column, they spell the name of the person who's, who I'm writing about, um, which is sort of a, a convention of 19th century morning poems. Um, so you don't need to know that. Uh, to listen to the poems, but I guess I just want to get credit for it. So. <laughs> so the first poem is called A in May. Al fresco on a chair bed, the woman confirms the natural. Natural it is to be disgusted and hopeless. Disgusted and hopeless at being related to her. Relating to her is what keeps me alive. Even the unfair trees in the lawn are alive. Alive with beating life, she flies in the face of five W's. What, when, where, why, why. On the chair bed, she is breaking out of the sun and the lawn. Really, out of the sun and the lawn and the trees and me. I am still studying, aren't you? Whether we accept these processes or are repulsed by them, we are still studying, each of us one cell in a universe of process. Realm of the universe hers and realm of the bourgeois da, da, da. On the chair bed in the sun, she's turning yellow. She's part of the carbon cycle. I tow several pits on the lawn. She's been eating cherries and has dropped pits on the lawn. It's natural to have lost my breath and found several pits on the lawn. <coughs> so as I just implied, there are other elegies, in the acrostic elegies in the book, too, um, of famous people who died while I was sort of in the process of writing the book. And um, I'm going to read those now. There are five of them. Uh, and the first one is for Amy Winehouse. All song is formal, and you maybe felt this and decided you'd be formal too. The eyeliner, the beehive, formal. When a desire to escape becomes formal, it's dangerous. Then escape requires nullity rather than a walk in the park or a movie. Eventually, nullity gets harder and harder to achieve. After surgery, I had opiates. I pushed the button as often as I could. Understood by music was how I felt. An escape so complete it became a song. After that, elegies the only necessary form. The next one is for Steve Jobs, and it borrows from a Sylvia Plath poem called Mirror, which begins, um, uh, it's the mirror talking, and the first line is, I am silver and exact, I have no preconceptions. Um, and so I quote from that poem in this elegy for Steve Jobs. Say you lost all your money or turned against your ambition. Then you would be at peace, or else why did the mind punish the body? Vengeance is mind, says the body. Ever after, you're a mirror, silver and exact. Just like the bug in a string of code, 
the body defies the mind or looks in the mirror of the mind and shudders. Better instruments are better because they're silverish but intact. The next one is for Troy Davis, who was a young man who was um, executed by the state of Georgia. Troy Davis. <clears throat> the clock is obdurate, random and definite. Obdurate the calendar. You thump on the cot, another signature. Did it, didn't do it, would do it again. And if a deferred dream dies, please sign the petition. Very good, let's hunt for a pen. If you thump, there's another signature, and signatures are given freely by the signer's hand. The next one is for Lucian Freud, who was a, a British painter. Lucian Freud, lingering over unlovely bodies, couldn't help intuitively rendering a whole nother angel. Facts are relics. An effect worth undertaking, yes, dear daylight? And then the final of these little elegies is for Donna Summer, who I don't know if there are some among us who are too young to know who Donna Summer was, but um, she was a great singer of disco music um, who died in the early 2000s. Donna Summer. Discourse that night concerned the warm-blooded love we felt. On the divan and in the ballroom and on the terrace we felt it. Now virtue meant liking the look of the face we lay next to. Never mind the sting of the winter solstice, all discourse that night concerned the warm-blooded love we felt. Something lifted us higher. Her little finger told her so, untangling with careless skill the flora of the sexual grove. Master physician with a masterly joy in wrapping up mud-spattered, coke-dusted wounds at midnight, when it's too early to stop dancing and go home. Our lily minds, soothed by her royalty, concealed in the synthesizers in the flora of the sexual grove. So I realized at some point in my poetry writing life that I, without planning it, have written a lot of poems about getting lost, which sort of, I feel like this conference is going to be another opportunity to write a poem about getting really lost, because it means getting really lost. But this is one of them. Um, and it's, it's from a true experience I had where uh, I went on a hike uh, with my sister, her son, my daughter, and our niece. And, you know, things didn't go as planned. So, and it's called the Millipede. <clears throat> we didn't know how to begin, the five of us. You and I, sisters, my daughter, your son, our niece, didn't know where to begin in the scrubby woods, past gas stations and friendlies, and into patchwork sheep. You had promised a hike, a two-hour hike. On that August afternoon, all we could walk, with the kids, the packs, the bag of clementines, five half-eaten lunch sandwiches, five canteens. The map at the trailhead showed a waterfall. We followed a dry creek bed, rough with pebbles. The trees would spend, I read, 300 years growing, then 300 years living, and 300 dying. You saw a rotten gray log, a pointed rock. Isn't it beautiful? No, I laughed. The kids balked and grumbled. I mean, I like being out in nature. No, you like being outside, as in a chair, you reminded me. <laughs> Who wants a clemmy? Water? Your son ran ahead. The day grew hotter. The girls wanted him to wait up. We were stuck. No signs, no guide. Our cell phones wouldn't work. And we didn't know how to go on. This was the summer the economy couldn't grow. What grows forever was my opinion. I knew a thousand experts would tell me a thousand times how wrong I was. 
that sugar and vitamin C revived us a little. We found the waterfall not more than a trickle that dry summer. Now to find the trailhead. Three teenage boys on the cliff smoking weed. Yell, yeah, look for the footbridge. Once you see it, you'll know you're almost there. Can't miss it. We missed it, though, like the dumb economy missed again and again. Our way was up a perilous incline. Your son turned over a stone. Look, isn't it beautiful? A millipede, many-legged, red-brown, immobile. Move, your son said, poking with a stick. My daughter, no, don't do that. You'll hurt it. Our niece said, a millipede is not a caterpillar. A millipede doesn't want a do-over. The millipede didn't move and never flew. And where was the footbridge? Still, we didn't know how to end. Much later, we did arrive, unclear. We hated it. Let's do it again next year. In the scrubby woods, the millipede thinks, I'm alive and safe where I am. Why should I move? So, um, so the book kind of follows a chronological progression in that it starts when A is sick and by the end, in the, the last section, she has died. And so I'm going to read a few poems from that section now. And this is the title poem called The Do-Over. It's about grief and sort of how to process it, I guess. The Do-Over. I will not, will not take my authority to feed my lucky hungers, nor dub thee full of mourning while the sun is loving me. No aspect of life is to be despised, though we're still sitting cranky in the meadow, sick, singed, loud, and daring. I see the forest, I see the trees. What I can't see is the dappled clearing I'm standing on though I know it's deserving of the pinkest halos. To be left with you, big sky god, to be a dreamer overly? Have I traversed the wood only to go to? No. My hand is Wyoming, discovered. It turns the pages of the recent self-help literature, and wherever I look, there are faces like some memes. So kiss the mainstream culture, let it go. Let go of that beautiful despair. The shackles of the lyric, let them go. In the clearing, the now is falling. We clean ourselves, preserve our sanity by playing, work quickly with fine impulses. The color of what we choose turns into a remedy, an important minor sacrament. There's something modern within us, grieving in middle age, and its intensity stands between us and death in the school, the dappled school of patience. Thank you. So the next poem is um, inspired by a painting, actually my favorite painting of all time, which is um, Botticelli's Primavera, which I'm sure a lot of you know is um, it's the one with Venus in the middle, and then the three graces on her left side dancing in a circle. And then uh, Mercury's on the extreme left, stirring up the clouds to part them to allow spring to come through. And then on the other, on the right side, there's um, some god chasing a nymph. And in order to avoid him, she turns into a flowering tree, I think. Uh, and I never remember his name, but I, I, and Cupid's on top. So I always think it's funny that the, the male figures in the painting are around the edges, and they're always causing trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so this poem is called The Arrival of Spring. So then you were, so then I was what? And the whole sea beach just beyond the trees widens. Italian, blonde, charming. In a scarcity economy, kindness is bred. And if kindness comes from lust, so be it. 
a bubbly state of monumental opportunity has left every gal a little bit pregnant, while every guy hangs around the edges, stirring the ship. And yet they are heinous, an old-time ardor prevails. Of course, we are endlessly fascinating to ourselves. What you did to, for me, what I did for you, masters the world with great dark injury, afterwards sitting crisscross applesauce on the meadow floor. And even <coughs> when mastered, broken, we feel pleasantly free. Love triumphs over brutality because brutality must end with death and love never does. It can always find a new sky or a sheepdog. And we believe this because it's our job to believe it. And if you can't believe it, perhaps you need a harder kick in the ass or whispered admiration delivered in a loose, slurred voice. Notice, please, the freshness, the tang that says the only thing to do is keep working. Master the same world, please with petite lips of ecstasy. Remember the sweat weather is months away. Beneath the cult a Baroque mystery, mischievous and sans pain. Under the feet, the splaying myrtle. Around the pretty faces, the year's first no seams. Below the canopy, all is explained. Everything's explainable and explained. So it would be nice to leave it there, wouldn't it? <laughs> Everything explainable and explained, but no. Um, so uh, this is the last poem I'm going to read from this book, and it's an A poem. It's called A in September, and she has died by this point. A in September. A piece of you flew into me one day, a niggling, hooked little finger of spirit. I was driving. It didn't hurt, it tickled. Randomly, I'd been wondering how to become a baby cuddler. Even though I didn't have a baby anymore, I could substitute. After all, lots of hospitals must need cuddlers. Forget it, I thought immediately. It wouldn't be the same. Oh, it tickled when I knew it would never be the same, and I remembered suggesting it to you once. When you were sad, there were no more babies in your life. No toddlers, your grandchildren were tweens now. Except you didn't like the idea. You wanted a connection you couldn't really get from a scheduled cuddle with an unrelated baby. Only from an impossible baby of your own. So you had limitations too. What you taught me, screw limitations. Love anyway and hard. I remembered this when it flew the peace in me of you. So, now a few new poems. <clears throat> so last year, or I, mean, I guess it was two years ago, I gave a reading, and afterwards a poet who was in the audience said to me, your poems are good eccentric but good. <laughs> and so if I had had a good response to that at the time, I probably wouldn't have needed to write this little rant. <laughs> but I did write this little rant. And Emily Dickinson makes a cameo appearance in it. She said or wrote once um, in a letter to someone, all men say what to me? Meaning she felt misunderstood by everyone she met. Like, all men said, what? <laughs> um, and so she appears in this poem. And I think oh, there's a little tiny bit of French in the first stanza, say show en, which you probably, a lot of you probably know. It means that's warm or that's hot, isn't it? So. <clears throat> To the poet who after my reading said, your poems are good, eccentric but good. Imagine that you, at 18, in Paris for the first time with all your loving ideals about penises intact, 
in your new mini trench coat and smelling the smell of garlic and unfiltered smoke and assaulted coffee were approached from behind. Imagine un Francais, bald, smooth, spectacled, grabbed your right hand and pressed it to his yes, soft, yes, exposed penis, and hissed, say show, eh? as he kept walking past you, shaking with his poor French demented laughs. Would you say trauma? It wasn't. Would you think poem fodder? Would you bring to bear your rhetoric textbook and wall of metaphors built up from yes stone, yes sky, yes Shakespeare? You, no not arrogant, mentioned your encroaching baldness, which I said that I, yes, liked. You were not spectacled nor smooth, but admire, I think, smoothness. You didn't want to say bad, you couldn't commit to good. Smoothly the current does not run, smoothness can never shock. When electricity veins through the sky, is that really its best, its crispest manifestation? Must Emily Dickinson ride through the yes, cloud dark sky on a flashing bolt, screaming, all men say what to me? Hands tattooed with the small crosses that meant she couldn't choose, slash settle on an ideal word. Abandoned possibility fairer than prose for a what word? Imagine this same hot lightning snaking up your rectum. That was childbirth, 14 hours hard work. And my husband's smell and my cow moans and the midwife's watered down grape juice helped. I couldn't call it pain, no, orgasm, no, earthquake, closer, but no. But I wanted so to call it something. This is the merry disease we share. I suspected that the Queen's English and I would not run smoothly then. So I wept past imagining. Is it possible that death will be a yes? Immortality, but a, not a marble stone, but a what? Silver perfume? There is no yes true metaphor, each eccentric as the others. <clears throat> When I dab my wrists and neck with the oily roller ball of my favorite perfume essence, Rain by Terra Nova, a bargain at yes, less than $20 for 0.3 ounces, notes of lily of the valley, clover, and musk, I do it because it smells fresh, like a new earth. Imagine that same lightning struck you down on the new earth dead. You'd say critical judgment. I'd say poor social skills. <laughs> Imagine instead the lightning struck the earth and a laurel bloom where once stood only tombstones. I know it's hard to be a man with an ideal between your legs and Shakespeare and cold lightning waiting for you on Judgment Day. Let's wait together. We open our hearts and dictionaries. You were waiting, weren't you? for me to say, gee, thanks, and are still, what, yes, no, waiting? <laughs> <laughs>
One was the goddess of spring, or was that in Botticelli's picture that I saw in the same library in a book of art history for kids? Old European art, of course. The other kinds they did not want us to know about. The picture was magic, and so was Johnny and Jill, though not a children's classic. I don't really remember the title. In the book, the goddess of spring rescues the children in trouble, and then I can't remember a thing. I'm sure there was a villain in the book, probably a woman, who practiced dark arts on a dark hill, so evil she wasn't human. In the story of my life, there is a hill that tamely rises above the field. We sledded there in winter. In spring, our bikes wheeled down the hill dangerously. I walked on the hill this summer, tamely, carefully, slowly, alongside my mother. It isn't hard to say what had brought us there. We were old and middle-aged in the night-like <clears throat> summer air. Slowly and tamely we walked, and I remembered the book. It was called Julie and John. I wanted another look. So what was the title? And was it an allegory? A Catholic one? It was a Catholic school. That would ruin the story. A story is only good if it's made up, but convinces you it's true. Even better if one of the characters is someone who could be you. How else do you know who you are? I once asked an old strange friend. You only know you're the person who's with the people you love in the end. From the hill I saw the house. I imagined myself on the stair, clutching the wrought iron rail, a beanie on my bright hair. On the hill I thought of the book. That old strange book would save me. But Google was not my friend, or maybe I was crazy. Years had passed since I read the book, my hair was darker, my body had opened to make a person, my cheekbones were starker. Still I kept hold of the book like a talisman or a bluff. Any book I'd seen that was like it was not like it enough. Research didn't help and memory is no good. Longing was all I could do and making up as much as I could. <laughs> Many books have I read, many people loved. They mattered and mattered and mattered. I tried but never found the book. The field is where I'll be scattered. Thank you very much.